And they were like, we might have to put a fence around it. And I was like, please do. That would be amazing. Just the idea that you had to fence off the artwork because you have to protect people from being idiots. Michael Lennick was like, hi, Michael, you know, from the Mattress Factory. We were wondering if you'd want to consider doing a show with us. And I almost dropped the phone and crashed my car, you know? I mean, I just kind of like, what? Most business majors would look at an artist and say that is the worst business model ever. A lot of it is just dealing with people and what are their expectations of what your expectations are. Welcome to the Installation Art Podcast, the world's number one and only podcast about installation art and the people who make it. I am your host, Anastasia Parmson, and today's guest is an American artist, Jason Peters, based in Brooklyn, New York. Jason transforms discarded objects into provocative installations that challenge viewers to find beauty in the overlooked. We will explore the evolution of his creative process that draws inspiration from ready-made and assemblage and is built around the concept of scale and multiples. In his most recent work, he uses hundreds of buckets and LED lighting to create what you would almost call drawings in space. It is my pleasure to introduce Jason Peters. Thanks for doing no, this. No, thank you. Let's go right back to the very, very beginning and start with where did you grow up? I grew up in Munich, Germany, the son of American parents who grew up in Nebraska. My mother wanted to get out and they went to Europe for a moment, kind of like what everyone was doing in the 60s and ended up in Augsburg. So they learned German, liked it a lot, went back to the States and then um, compressed time. I was born in Mobile, Alabama, and then we moved about a year later to Germany. I was pretty much raised in the south of Germany from kindergarten through 18. Mm, wow. You finished high school in Germany, and uh, you went to college after that? I was, um, most of the people I talked to who were artistically inclined in Germany, and especially expats, suggested <laughs> to go to the States, try everything, then figure out what I wanted, because I knew I always wanted to do art. From that point, then I was like, well, I'll go to the States, figure out what discipline of art I want to pursue, and then maybe come back. So I went straight from Munich, Germany to Baltimore, to the Maryland Institute College of Art. And from there, I ended up in New York, because I kind of could see my life at whatever you can at 23. If I stayed in Baltimore, I'd probably own a house, have two kids, a dog, a car, a wife, have my own business or something. I was like, I'm 23. That's too soon to see that part of my life. So I moved up to New York and never moved away. <laughs> right. So sounds like you were an artsy kid. Yeah. I mean, I think there was always um, investigative, inquisitive, and I know I never necessarily register myself as a nerd, but I was very nerdy and outdoorsy. I just wanted to know how things work. Um, and Munich has an amazing canon of museums and collections. And then, you know, also with the social surrealists, the constructivists, uh, the whole 1920s movement, their collections have, you know, some of the seminal works by most of European artists. To me, there was just always a gravity because it was just a way of expression by presenting a physical object. Yeah, it just seemed to make sense to me from an early age. Did you want to be an artist from an early age? I had that thought or the idea of making art. Like, I don't know when that necessarily is like, I'm going to be an artist. But when I moved to New York, I had a thought of like, I am an artist and I'm going to have a loft and live workspace. And Crazy enough, that worked out. Yeah, that's pretty cool. This to point of like how people touch you, especially art teachers or people in your life and how, how they put you on your path. I have a clear memory of being in first grade. And there was a couple of, let's say, you know, whatever they call it, gifted kids or kids that seem to be excelling at art than the others. So the art teacher at the time got permission to take like six of us out once a week to get a little more time in. And we went to draw horses off the back lot of the school. 
it just was such a profound moment because we're all it's like, hey, it's like draw the horses they're walking around and like god this is hard they keep moving so i ended up with this drawing of parts of horses but then if i didn't get the legs i would draw a bush or if i had the back end i'd draw a building even though they weren't there but to register that oh this is what you can see because i didn't get to what you couldn't see <laughs> And then the teacher turned hers around and it was a complete horse. And she was like, well, you choose one horse and then you follow it around and you wait till it gets back in the same position and you keep drawing. And I just remember my brain blew up in first grade. I just remember that <laughs> I felt so, not dumb, but I was just like, of course, like, how did I not think of such a simple solution? <laughs> An epiphany moment. Mm -hmm. So how did you get into making large sculptures and installations? Getting into the larger work, um, a lot of it was, I think, being outside. And I don't know if it's the Alps, but I always felt a correlation between the human form and an object. Like the way you feel when you come up to a building, I wanted to understand, like, how does that work? Like, how can you build a space or make a thing? And it has this resonance and it resonates with pretty much most of society, you know. So when I was in college, I didn't know necessarily what discipline. So I did them all and liked them. But then something about sculpture and the 3D environment, spatial relations and all that kind of stuff, positive, negative space, because it's the real world, because that's the world we inhabit. That's the world we know as humans. You know, we walk through space. So when you come to up to a doorway, like, what is the size of that doorway? And that makes you feel like when you think about churches, sometimes they create really small doors so that when you walk through, then you have this visceral physical aspect of that. And, and so that was always in the back of my mind. And then when I had um, Arthur Benson, who's my first year teacher, and I'd made all these like, you know, nice sculptures out of found objects or whatever. And then he was like, You're, this is boring. And his words, not mine, but you're like a racehorse trotting around instead of sprinting. So he, he insulted me enough to get, get me to be like, well, fuck you. And I'll prove you wrong. It pushed me because then I was like, okay, what do you do? My mind is just like, okay, I could do like, a, you know, like Desuvru or, you know, all the big more male, not macho. I mean, well, some of them are macho, but just like that kind of German have a word for it. it's potzik. It's like, kind of beefy art stuff and i was like well i'm one person i don't have the logistics i don't have all these other aspects that you would require like how do i do it but have the same impact and then i was looking around the studio and the one thing i noticed that was tons of were those steel studio chairs and i was like well there's at least 200 on the first floor which means i don't have to go upstairs downstairs so one night and there was this massive cast iron table for assembly and then I remember just driving along and I look over and there is like oh, maybe 12 centimeter lumber square, like maybe two meters. There's nothing else on the bed, but the truck driver had stacked them up maybe a meter and a half and then put one at the top to triangulate the top and just one strap. So it's compression. And then the, the act of this ratchet strap, so you can reuse it. I was just like, that's amazing. So suddenly I was just like, oh, compression tie things together, tie them apart, and the ratchet straps can put immense power on it so you could strap something to a wall or any which way. So the combination between that, my teacher, these chairs, then looking at the table, I just went like, you know, and just in one night, I was like, well, it's always better to ask for forgiveness than for permission. So I took all the chairs and strapped them to this table and just kind of created like this wave arc just teetered out uh, maybe like five meters from the table, interlocked them and then used these straps to just hold the parts together. So they weren't my chairs. I just had to move them. I wasn't going to damage them or not any more than a person sitting and I can put them all back. And since it was mm -hmm. the first crit of the day, I, I kind of knew enough of the scheduling that I knew I could probably get through my crit, return them to all the classrooms and no one would be the wiser. And so that's kind of how installation work was that anything could be a building block and we like pattern. So like a chair just becomes another innocuous thing that then when you assemble creates a, a larger or different pattern. I feel like we're 
innately drawn to patterns, whether they're good or bad, because we're familiar, because of our heart rate, we breathe, the sun rises, sun sets. In the way, you know, like, so there's all these major patterns that kind of affect us. So I was like, well, if I use that in a visual context, then at least I'll have the viewer maybe a little longer because it won't feel as alien, even though it's boring. Mm. So basically, that was your first foray into Delay. using multitudes of an object, installing, but you kept using chairs after that. Chairs because they're readily available. I started basically gravitating to anything that was free. I mean, because at that point I was 20 or something like that. And I also started just doing them on sites. I was familiar with Andy Goldsworthy's work. And so I was like, I could be an urban Andy Goldsworthy. So I started building sculptures, taking photographs. But then you end up in this purgatory of photography and then sculpture. I mean, it's amazing when certain artists, some would say get away or some can really drive it home. And maybe it's because natural objects are considered more ephemeral than man-made objects. The idea of like, this is more ephemeral than a chair, you know, a leaf being frozen to another leaf in the cold of winter to get a photograph that once the sun hits it collapses the understanding is that that photograph can only be the end product whereas maybe with chairs it's not that case uh, but i did like start to understand like that's a funny place to be sometimes it doesn't quite equate to what you would hope but then i also understood through him and other artists that do their own documentation that documentation is everything and since most of the time i would do my installations in the middle of the night more like guerrilla style i would do them photograph them and then put them back like i wasn't even there so that's not necessarily helpful <laughs> so your final product was actually mostly photos. yes which i thought would work but then it doesn't take necessarily visceral because the impact of some of these because they were so much larger the way that it it touches you when you see the work visually and physically in the same space, that maybe I was losing out on that aspect. So that's how it started. And then I just, anything I get my hands on in quantity. And then people are like, oh, well, you could use anything. Amazingly enough, it's enlightening to realize that you're still very picky, even when you could have anything. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you get into showing your work publicly, the actual installations, what was your first big project and how did it come about? Let's see. I was applying to a lot of residencies, art grants, or just opportunities. And my mother lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico, or moved there after I left Germany. And so there was a Center for Contemporary Arts in Santa Fe. They would take open calls. A lot of places at the time were taking artists' slide registry. Like you could put yourself on file and, and then if you're in a registry and someone's like, I'm looking for sculpture and installation, then there's the 10 names and then that's all they can choose from. So I put myself on there and then luckily for me, I get this email saying, would you be interested in this 10,000 square foot space with a very small budget? And I was like, of course, you know. <laughs> so basically I, I say yes. And then I'm like, okay, this is my chance. I don't know when I'm going to have another show or opportunity so i decided to yeah. let amex visa and mastercard do the work non-officially of course so you remember what the budget was that they were offering i you? think it was like space and maybe a thousand dollars to fill ten thousand square ten thousand square feet and so i took on the majority of the burden myself i was just like well you never know it's an opportunity and I wanted to do something, so I self-funded. So I gathered all these materials. I found like crutches, Vietnam Army cots, uh, airplane seats from some, I don't know what plane from probably 1972, um, tires, railroad ties. Did you source all that locally yeah. while you were there? I don't necessarily have a, a studio practice, more like Gabriel Rosco, who's always like, the artist is where the studio is, or the studio is where the artist is. Mm -hmm. Being in New York, it's like, why bother owning anything? We're consecrating waste streams. And so I just 
I had done some railroad tie pieces, pallet pieces, and you know, some of the stuff had to be purchased. So it was like, what's the lowest price point? There was this amazing resource called the Black Hole in Los Alamos, New Mexico, um, which was mind blowing. It was created by an ex employee who basically created a surplus. After Vietnam, a lot of the materials went into what they called army surplus. So the massive warehouses filled with uniforms, uh, anything that was used for the war that was trying to be resold. I mean, if I had the money for it, I would have allowed myself to spend even more. It was just like a treasure trove. If I'd have been smart, I could have probably paid for it by getting a semi-truck, buying all the vintage steel case furniture there and going to New York City and selling it for five times the amount. But <laughs> my mind doesn't quite work that way. <laughs> so, yeah. So that was like your big first? Well, that was, I was really excited because it was this massive, you know, 10,000 square feet is 900 square meters, I think. Um, but then yeah. the city owners came in and condemned the building, or at least had the fire department say, it's not safe. I mean, this is like a warehouse. It's structurally fine, but there wasn't the right fire inspection. So suddenly I was shoved into 2,000 square feet. So then I have all these piles of stuff that I was going to have individual sculptures based on themselves to themselves. So then I started combining them. And that's when I, I took all these different materials and I wanted to make a sphere. Like, how do you make a sphere that's 20 feet tall for cents on the dollar? And I was like, well, tires are readily available. I'd done some experiments in New York City and realized, well, I need an armature. So then I just created an armature and then skinned it with tires. And so then you had this really beautiful positive negative space. And then the hole happened to be the exact same size as that a bucket can fit through. And so I was able to combine all these materials and still make the best of a situation that had changed. Okay, so that was your first big installation. What has been your biggest opportunity so far um, do you think there's two shows after that that then allowed for kind of a series of different events um the mattress factory in pittsburgh which is an institution that's dedicated to installation art by barbara and michael who are the directors um yeah it changed my life because they basically gave me a, a large budget to do whatever i wanted I was like, well, how much do I have? And she's like, well, like, what do you want to make? And I was like, well, how much do I have? And I went back and forth because early on realized that it's better to know what you have than what you want because it's nothing like coming up with a dream and then being like, well, can you half your dream? <laughs> there were three shows right back to back. Two I did myself, but those two then allowed the mattress factory to happen. And then one of the other pivotal was the Pulitzer Art Foundation did a chose four different people and I was amongst one of them. That was basically a series of 900 buckets in succession. So a giant serpent within a, a square grid and then mm -hmm. kept going kind of with these more like serpentine sculptures. But then more recent was the show in Sao Paulo because since I've been making these serpentine sculptures or installations, I resisted putting LED lights for a long time because I just didn't want to end up looking like a a deli sign uh, because the really good ones you couldn't even afford at the time and then the bad ones ended up looking like a deli sign like minimal color range i'd rather mm -hmm. just have it white and i just also just liked it white um, but then you start seeing with the phones and our attention span all everything kind of shifting it's like it's got to do something it can't just sit there anymore and if it's not going to move it's got to mm -hmm. flash you know so i'm like shit okay so if listeners go on your Instagram now, it is mainly these serpentine lit up sculptures. How did you come to discovering those? The process was that show in New Mexico. I was literally just driving around the New Mexico countryside looking for mountains of material that would suffice to fill space that I could either move myself. And I think that's another thing within the process and just how I I've always worked is like, I can't rely on anyone else. So if I can't do it myself, then how could I expect anyone else to do it? But then how do you make things the size of a house? How do you do it in a certain amount of time? But no, I was driving through the, the Mexico landscape and there's this just giant yellow pile. And then I was like, what material is yellow? And then how does someone have so much in their backyard? And for what reason? Because it's just like barbed wire fences, like probably like parts of Australia, just barbed wire fences, grass, it's brown because there's no water. 
and then like little houses dotted and it's like what what the fuck's that guy doing so i'm like well let me go ask you know and then being out in the midwest it's like well i hope i don't get shot you know so i'm like i roll up to the house i didn't knock door this lovely woman answers the door and i was like i'm looking for materials or something or i need buckets because i suddenly recognize their buckets do you know if those are available i'd love to get a hand on them and She's like, well, they're my husband's. Basically, were construction buckets that were yellow that by our company called Stowe, which makes synthetic stucco. I gave her my number and said, please ask your husband to give me a call. And I'm happy to take his trash, so to speak, and get a phone call. And it's like, what do you want to do with him? It's like, well, I'm doing this project and I wanted to build something or try something out because all of a sudden I just full fledged saying, I'm an artist. You know, some people just hear the word artist and they shut the door. <laughs> He just said, yeah, take as many as you want and leave me 30. So I would grab 350 of them. And wow. anything that nestles is also always attractive because it'll take up less space. And I had a Toyota. They're pretty teeny tiny. And so I fit yeah. 300 buckets in there. And that's how I got them. And then I just sat in the in the, the exhibition space and was just staring at it. Like, I don't know. I stacked them. I did all the basic things until I was pulling them in and out. And I noticed the the gap and then realize that they'd lock up you know like if you pull them out they fall apart but as you pull them out the range of motion gets bigger and bigger and then i was like well if i pop and screw north south opposite one another then it locks up and does that but then if i change the angle of the north south then i can get a corkscrew i can do this i can do that and then if i pop two more screws in, i lock it up then it's a static shape and then I can literally draw in space. And it's th that, that moment in time is what then propagated all the rest of them. And then in about 2006, the mattress factory called me because it was such an important U.S. institution. I was like, well, I only have to make the best work of my life because I have to sit next to all these massive artists. It's like a slew of the who's who of installation artists because they've given most artists their yeah. first break. Like Kusama, James Terrell, Chris Burden. I mean, the list is pretty, pretty impressive. Uh, I'm like, like, you know, 29. And I'm like, did you have that moment of fear? Yeah. You're a young artist trying to do it. And then you get that phone call, you know, and Michael Lennick was like, hi, Michael, call, you know, for the mattress factory. I almost dropped the phone and crashed my car, you know. I mean, it just kind of like, what? We were wondering if you might have time or you'd want to consider doing a show with us. And I was trying to keep my shit together. I was like, yes, of course. Um, let me check my schedule. I'll get back to you. I really was overthinking it. And it, I'm always was just trying to create something like maybe opulent. And then I suddenly just thought about what is sculpture, but positive and negative space because I love light and most of the installations I've always chose are either something either about the, the light in a, in a specific spot and the way the architecture of the space even if it's a dump how it feels yeah and then i was like well if i cover everything in black carpet and then i put one of these bucket sculptures and put light on the inside then i remove all architecture from frame of fields except for the fact that your feet are grounded but mm. for a split second you're in an abyss so i covered everything in black carpet and made the biggest sculpture for the size within inches of the wall and the floor and ceiling. Mm. But then I lowered the light to just enough current to make it go on, but not so you could, it could send enough light to see things. So I, I reduced that yeah. down to then create this um, sculpture that you could walk around with no competition of architectural space until you ran into a wall because you didn't see the wall or see other people. So sometimes you thought you were alone in the space and then a person would walk in front of the sculpture. There was a lot of moments of people being mm -hmm. freaked out because they thought they were viewing it by themselves. The other thing that the carpet did, which was intentional, was it took away all reflective sound, which is also very weird. Mm -hmm. We rely on it so heavily, like, you know, when you're tuned into it. So all these things then led to me making these linear pieces because I just wanted to draw in space. Do you build everything yourself? Pretty much. When I can outsource, I love to. I did a lot of the stuff for years on my own with very little help. But then of late, if I can hire assistants, I try to. Or at least if it's at the bare minimum that, you know, they get 
fed and libated, if that's a word, um, so that they're happy helping me <laughs> make my madness come true. Do you always have to be present during the installation? Not for the components. For the larger ones, it all breaks down into things. So a lot of it's drilling holes, drilling this. So certain processes, I can show one person, they can show another person. I'm usually most of the time, I would say 90%. Or if it were remote or if I had a conflict, I have one or two people I can send who have worked with me enough and understand my be like yeah no like that you know and they can take that <laughs> and make it into where i want it at least get it close but the beautiful thing about sculpture the agonizing also part is i like when it all kind of relates to itself the way i want it to especially with these serpentine structures i'm always walking around the sculpture so that all the parts they're all dynamic um, mm -hmm. um or at least that's one of the things that makes me happy so but yeah it's it is possible but none of these are planned out i will take composites and badly photoshop and drop things in but they're always unique to that space or environment so sometimes they're more open and sometimes they're more manic maybe so your work is always site specific yeah like the process stays the same but the the pieces because a lot of the earlier ones were really integrated so like if you have let's say, a garden with a bunch of trees i can use all the trees kind of like a marionette and then have the whole thing be like a real serpent and really move around in the environment i think crystal wagner their bigger installations are literally chicken wire and tissue paper i mean at least for these installations that are temporary and so the nice thing is that material lends itself to complete topography and then also you can create color pattern and dynamic texture with them. I've always enjoyed her process in that. I mean, that's what I love about installation and a specific assemblage or found object installations because you can tie it into the community. Um, you know, I love waste streams, just looking around what is available because the biggest hindrance, I think, for making large scale work is logistics of, of movement of material and weight. So if your material is lightweight, which means you don't need forklifts. Yeah. Your site is fairly accessible by ladders or scaffolding versus rental of cherry pickers, because then that brings the cost up. Then it really can become part of, of a space, which is why I reference her, because like chicken wire, she can envelop in anything and then cover it and, and treat it in her language. And I feel like mine is like I can zip time together, screw them together, but then it also all can come apart and then go back into the waste stream, or it can be reconfigured to fit somewhere else. So it's reusable. Oh, yeah. So let's talk about that circle of materials. Mm -hmm. You must have gone through a lot of buckets by now. Where do you source them? Do you still find discarded ones? That's how I started, because even a bucket nowadays, I think, is $7 a pop. How many do you typically use in one sculpture? Generally two three hundred to the minimum of the larger ones is 200 mm -hmm. but i used to source materials like the chair frames um banquet hall put chairs in the backyard out in the open and i was like well are you throwing those out and he's like well no give me five bucks a piece it's like you're leaving them outside they're gonna get wet and get destroyed so i just waited a year next year there were no backs so the backs fell off everything was gone they were rusting they're perfect and then it said like two bucks or something. I was like, screw that. So I just waited till they got a dumpster. And then in the middle of the night, everything they put in the dumpster had pulled another hundred out. But it all takes space. So it's like, I also realized that the money that comes out of the logistics, shipping, this and that. So like, how do I keep as much money to make the thing I want to make? And I think that was the key for me. It's almost like the necessity and the ec economics all lined up so that I was like, okay, well, found object recycling um looking in the community for people that throw out stuff i mean there was a i don't think it exists anymore but like a craig space for what people threw out so instead of paying people to recycle it they posted it and said hey we're a foam company and we throw out x amount of foam by volume because they have to pay a dumpster company to remove it i think it was called waste stream 
from their dumpster to your bottom line. That was the tagline. I always remember that part. And that's how I found the buckets. Like I found a baker in South Brooklyn who was throwing out 20 to 30 buckets of sugared egg yolk, which was fun to clean, but um, they were free. And there were square buckets, which was also fun. Mm -hmm. I had a studio in New York for about 10 years where I had enough material around on hand. But then nowadays, unfortunately, through mass production and the lack of willingness of people to necessarily recycle in a meaningful way, it's cheaper to buy it new because shipping is included. (laughs) Right. That's the other thing is why I gravitate to materials that are global and commonplace in all environments. It means I can create the same work or similar work in different environments. But So you try to get them locally wherever your project is. Yeah, I mean, if I can recycle them, great. If a community has the time, organizational skills prior to my arrival to do, I'd rather recycle because it also opens up that whole dialogue and conversation to reuse. I've had it in the past where gardeners took all the buckets with the holes in it for for planting and for the community garden because they're great for getting things started you know then they don't have to buy the cheap ones because even that they cost two dollars you know it all kind of informs each other and so like when you start to look what do i have available instead of what i want there's um, tremendous resources and opportunities if you just readjust your needs or what you believe to be your needs Yeah, I do maybe three or four works a year if I get lucky. But in that time, what I do in two weeks of stress, like I know a lot of people can't operate that way. If one thing goes wrong, it's over. But to me, it's never over because failure is not an option. When you're building large scale, you know, there's gravity, there's logistics, there's supply chain, people get sick. You know, there's all these things when you compress that all down within a month, it's like other artists and, you know, spend time. They maybe take six months to make a painting. They do two a year. I just take all that energy and compress it <laughs> into a very finite moment that probably would have a lot of people just running or have a breakdown. I mean, I get close, but I'm, sometimes I'll be like, mm, that was close. And I try to mitigate that as best I can. But then also in those moments when I let it be, I've come up with other techniques or materials because I was so focused on one thing, but then when I let go of that one thing, then suddenly I was like, oh, you know, like you literally look in the ground, you're like, oh, what about that? But at some point you have to close the doors and get it done. It can't be like, what if, what about this? What about this? What about this? Mm. going to get nowhere. Well, can you share a, a specific story about something unexpected where something wasn't working at a critical moment? Yeah. I was doing a piece for a group in Atlanta called dashboard i had one whole room and i was super excited because i'd gotten a sponsor from another project to donate like sixteen thousand feet of reflective rope so it was like dig low with reflective parts into it and i was like oh this would be great but black light i was convinced i mean it's dig low orange i just didn't even think twice about it so i always test your materials so like two days before the opening i put the black light on i look at the barrel and there's nothing and i was like Yeah. So my solution, once I got back to reality, um, I was like, well, I know they make polyurethane for theater production so that you could have a chair on stage. It looks black and suddenly it does that. So, you know, these are like decisions you make. So it's $400 a gallon or almost five. And I'm looking at like three spools of 16,000 feet. So if I want that intensity, I have to get five or six. And again, you know, the budget was very small. So the other thing is also not local. So then it's overnight express. So mm-hmm. then suddenly you have a $500 gallon of paint that you're going to pay $200 to get by the next day. So then I'm just like, that's insane. Not the pricing because it's good stuff, but the express flight because of a mistake I made. So I was like, well, I could probably thin it out with water and gain some of the reflective quality of it. And so that's what I did is I took the one gallon and times to buy four because i knew i'd get enough residue on and the polyurethane certain one of them have like a slight pigmentation that helps agitate that so i've got a big tub and i just pulled them through and just whatever i got on them i got on them so like i basically treated maybe five thousand feet of it that was that was the one that probably the most hairy most i think 
traumatic. Did the diluted paint end up working okay? It worked pretty well, I think. But yeah, that was a lot of fun. I mean, in the end. <laughs> yeah, in the end, after it's all done. Yeah. What happens to the work when the exhibition's over? Most of the time, if it's locally sourced, it goes back into the waste stream. If it's stateside, I'll have some of it shipped back, depending what the material is. In the past, if I used tubes, I'd sometimes ship them, but sometimes it was just easier to donate them to people that needed them. Because everything's so readily available, I'm not so attached to the show in 2007, like the crutches, the airplane pillows, and certain things of that nature. I was attached, but then shipping them from New Mexico, the cost was on my shoulders. So I was like, well, I got them a dollar a piece, so I'm not going to pay. I think that's the value of like the shipping versus the cost of the material. But sometimes, yeah, they're, they're precious, but you know, until I have, um, the success that would warrant keeping materials, I'm fine with not holding on to them, but trying to find a good place for them because I, like to be as conscious as I can, especially when I have to buy things new because it's cheaper than getting them recycled. Yeah, right. So that means that most of your work is truly ephemeral. It just comes together and then when it's all over, it's disassembled and never recreated in that same form again. Yeah. I mean, the process is maybe like having a race car and driving different tracks, like the installation always changes. But yeah, if I get to see a piece more than two days or a week in my life, it's pretty unique because most of the time I do it and then I'm out of there and then they'll break stuff down. Depending on the hardware, I'll ship that back unless there's different avenues. Yeah, I mean, certain things that are high value, but the majority, that's why I also kind of like using the material because it's the commonality of the accessibility of something versus the inaccessibility. Mm. How did these large-scale sculptures and installations get funded generally? Most of the time is uh, nonprofits. I guess now that light festivals are a thing for cities, those because they'll be sponsors, and so yeah, it's sponsors, nonprofits, some private funding. So that's been the majority of of getting those things off the ground. People see it and be like, ooh, I want one of those. And because the materiality is also available everywhere, they're also very resilient because um, I've had them at, at festivals. You know, drunk and altered humans there. And also, once I saw they were kid-friendly, I figured they would be adult-friendly in inebriated states. Have you had anything damaged? No, I find that most people, because it involves electricity, and is alien enough that they don't know what it is necessarily right off the bat, it kind of gets a pass because it's kind of like, what will it do if I touch it? Is it safe? Can I hang on it? And, and you know, if you support it properly, you can sit on it, almost climb, but there's never really a good part. And things move enough that even when you start to do something, something else somewhere else has an effect to your cause. And then mm -hmm. people it, it gets some uneasy. I had one, I didn't make it out of heavy enough gauge, but I, I had a piece on Governor's Island once. It was a ball, and I think someone thought they could jump on it, so they jumped on it, and it just went, you know, it depressed, and so I just pulled it from the project. So the whole thing of never expect people not to touch your art, unless you yeah. have a guard, then you can expect that. <laughs> Even then, yes, it's true. I can, yeah, but at you. least they they won't get to a running start onto your piece. It took people about maximum three minutes to destroy one of my works oh, once. Wow! When the guard let their guard down, but you know, it's my bad for using such fragile material. I think that's an interesting. It's like all these potentials. I mean, I can make this piece that I'm really into. And then suddenly now I have to think about how to protect it. And if you get into plexiglass enclosures, suddenly you're looking at like a $4,000 budget just to make an enclosure so that you can publicly ex exhibit it. Like I had a show at Oklahoma City Museum, which was a massive space. We were having compliance talks because of what a wheelchair needs, I think, four feet which gives it clearance to mm. do a circle. Or even like when I did the piece of the Pulitzer for a moment, the insurance company was giving them kickback and they're like, we might have to put a fence around it. And I was like, please do. That would be amazing. That's coming out of your budget. But just the idea that you had to fence off the artwork 
because you have to protect people from being idiots. I mean, I do love the European model where the burden of proof relies on you. So like if you cross a fence and break your neck on the other side, you can't sue the person because you crossed the fence. Where in the States says, well, you didn't yeah. say do not cross the fence because you might receive bodily harm and then a litany of everything else. But, yeah. but those are part of making art. Sometimes when you make it, especially at a larger scale, it's like, is someone going to hurt themselves? And suddenly you're like, well, I just wanted to make the art, but I, I somehow incorporated that because I feel like, how do you get a guy who does concrete or does electrical work to maybe understand, like, why would you put a switch over here or there when they're looking at the plans? It's like, this is not how I do it. And people will walk off jobs because, no, no, that can't be done. And it's like, well, if you're open to it and it can be done because we know it is, but you know it's going to take too much work and you don't want to do it. That was your problem. I find that those things of when you deal with trades or you know, city councils or the public in general, if you look at Richard Serra's art in New York City, there's a seminal piece that was installed and then deinstalled. You know, they put it in the square. Everyone around the square knew about it. Then they installed it, and because it fucked with the people that wanted to go this way, you know, because the arc went that way, so they had to walk, let's say, with a hundred meters more to cross the square. That's about it. But that hundred meters was no fucking way, and so they <laughs> they sued, and then he countersued and got a shit ton of money to remove it, and then for breach of contract. But the crazy thing is that the public was fully made aware of this piece and then and then none of it was his fault but you know a rigging error caused the death on one of his installations and the backlash was so severe that it's like this is no fun and moved to germany or to europe but it's like logistics in the end a lot of it is just me sitting around talking to people making sure it all happens and then maybe half the time is actually making the work which once you make something it's out of your hands so you know like even for the viewers, hopefully get it as right as you can, but then also you'll get another chance. So don't, don't beat yourself up about it. But you know, that takes a while. I used to be like so meticulous about each bucket, each screw measurement that someone had realized in 15 years of making variations, only one person actually noticed that I had lined all the bucket handles exactly in the same spot. <laughs> right. So I was like, well, if everyone noticed every time, then I would keep doing it. But no, they can't tell. No one can tell. That's good. And if you have so much stuff, it makes it a little easier. I think making things minimal and perfect is probably harder to do. You know, if there's enough busyness, you can hide a lot of shit. But if it's just like a Judd, you better have everything perfectly aligned. What role do you see the audience playing in your work? And... How do you hope they react to it? I guess key. I mean, I consider them constantly, but I don't at the same time. <laughs> I make work generally because I, I want to see it. I need to see it, that compulsion. But I do love creating things that take them outside of themselves, which is also, I think, why I like abstraction more so than figurative, because it gives a viewer more of a bigger point. Because once they see a figure then all those paradigms of thoughts filter through. The abstraction allows, you know, what is it? How is it? Or I hate it or not. Until some people get close, they don't realize what is actually in front of them. So then maybe they're like, yeah, what is this pile of shit? But this pile of shit is made out of buckets or it's chairs. And it's like, what? It kind of shifts the one thing and moves it somewhere else. But a lot of it is just like, what does it mean to them? I think if you have a thought or a wish for what your work is supposed to say, and everyone in the room is coming back with not what you thought, then maybe your communication skills and what you're presenting isn't reading or coming across. <laughs> you can put a dialogue, a written statement, and guide them towards what you want them to think. But I think in the end, humans are humans, and they'll think whatever they want. They'll even ignore that, especially if they're not really into reading. Maybe they're more visual. But if they come back to you and they're happy or they're excited or they're frustrated, or maybe even fucking just hate it, but at least they're coming to you talking about it, that's a lot. That means they're engaged enough. And then if they dislike enough, yeah. they actually might remember your name. That's a successful. Like most <laughs> people don't necessarily remember my name. They can remember the work. <laughs> 
You've done a lot of stuff that's outdoors. Have you done any permanent public pieces? Permanent? I had two long-term pieces, one at the Drake Hotel in Canada. But I'm trying to think if there's anything. Basically, five to ten years is probably the most permanent. That's quite a long time. Yeah, that's probably the longest. I've been always dying to do more permanent because there's a combination between materiality and longevity. And I've been constantly looking for a material that I could either fabricate my own bucket. I mean, it's just a matter of budgets and, and numbers. Once the budgets hit a certain scale, then I can fabricate, let's say, my own bucket out of material that I can know will last, you know, whatever, 50 years or I mean, even most sculptures in sculpture gardens, they have some sort of budget worked in because or even like a Jeff Koons, they need to be refinished every, I think, 15 mm. or 20 years. I think most programs do 10 or 15. But even a stainless steel ionized sculpture is going to die in the heat at some point uh, or have to be, you know, repolished, repatinaed. The buckets have basically a solid 15 to 20 year lifespan. There are coatings that I've been looking into to get them to a 20, you know, for sure. I'm looking forward to making them out of glass or certain resins because they would be gorgeous, but they will also change the nature of what they are in that sense. I have means and avenues that I want to explore in that realm. I'm always excited about opportunities and materials. And, and sometimes you just have to also wait for the right material to come along for what you're making because there's always innovation. Does the process of making work for public art, for outdoors versus more traditional art exhibitions, is it very different? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're different as in they're just one has elemental requirements and human and the other one just has human because it can control the climate. I think a lot of it, like scale, I mean, I chose to work in a larger than myself scale. And so all those things combine it. I mean, for large scale sculpture, the foundation alone can run you what you're paid for the piece, depending where you are, what the labor laws are. But I, I think in general, getting something done, it's mainly the people, you know, like the institution, curator, city or city leaders, etc. Just listening to others and their concerns. And then, you know, sometimes either rolling those into a piece or um, making adjustments. A lot of times, you know, I work with a budget I have versus the budget I want. I think I can be like, what do I need to get done? And then can the rest of what needs to get done be done there? Or do I need to scale down and then also have that conversation, you know, like managing expectations. A lot of it is just dealing with people and what are their expectations of what your expectations are? <laughs> you have to balance those. And, um, I did self-funded projects and, it took a while not to spend everything on making it happen, even dipping in my own pocket when that was exhausted because it was too close to, to turn back, so to speak. But you also have to be responsible. Like most business majors would look at an artist and say that is the worst business model ever. I think it's gotten better over time with e-commerce and, and what the internet has allowed for a lot of artists is great. I've seen people build their whole entire client base themselves and then suddenly then become interesting to a gallery because they're like oh we can get a piece of that because of because they've already built their audience exactly which then you know mm -hmm. arguably should be a 40 60 maybe for a gallery instead of 60 40 or 50 50 i mean i personally never had a full-time gallery i've shown in galleries but not being represented but with my work i think a lot of it is institutional and public which i'm still getting my feet around because it's a, just a different way of, of being. I mean, I've made smaller works and I have drawings and sculptures and all these kind of different things that I do for myself that also I like doing, but the work that I would get called for is, you know, large scale immersive installations. As an independent artist, how do you approach the commercial aspect of your work? Have you ever sold an installation? Most of it comes down to more leasing. Basically, there's an artist fee, and then all costs are covered or part of the budget. And that's generally how that works. And I think that works pretty well. I mean, with the long-term installations, like at the Drake Hotel, make sure you have term limits on your pieces because that one just kind of stayed there. 
you know, it was more, more like a residency program. So I was paid for the installation. Then it just stayed. Mm-hmm. Because what was there, the shipping was going to cost a fifth of what the budget was. I just let it let it be until it needed to be removed. So yeah, I mean, I think the weight of what I would get if it was permanent, I would be more because I'm not going to get any of the materials. I'm not going to get any benefit once that's out in the world. Um, so I mean, I'm still new. Like I'm plug away. It's just more like how do I get these projects done is mainly my focus, and they don't come at an often enough rate that they're um, commercially viable. But I've definitely streamlined a lot of processes, whether they are for an event or for a museum, because luckily there's not a lot of adjustment needed. You know, it's just more about how big do you want it? Yeah, there's not a lot of difference between the two for most of my work because of the way I came about about it. Do you still apply for stuff? Um, I've been doing more now because the light work changed a lot of things. So like there's more interactive components. I can put voice triggers uh the colors or speed or different things can now could have meaning. So there can be a, a whole another layer to execution. So I've been slowly figuring out what I would want to say with that or what the interaction is like, you know, touching it. And as you move your hand across it, the light follows your hand, you know, that, those mm-hmm. kinds of things. But is that something people want also? Because that adds a whole nother budgetary layer to something. So. As it comes along, it's, do people want to work with me and figure it out? And then, you know, also want to loosen the purse strings or budget to, to make those things happen because there is a lot of fun to be had. It's more just like, who wants to have fun with me? <laughs> Can you share something that's your favorite resource or tool that makes your work and life easier? My wife, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Her brain operates differently from mine, so that's very helpful. Yeah. I mean, and I've enjoyed Instagram just for keeping things together uh, documentation-wise and then at least somewhat public. Um, Instagram was great because I'm, I'm visual and I'm a really bad writer. I guess certain of the AI programs or writing programs are great because... I'm very dyslexic, and you probably noticed in the conversation, but it's like something I've overcame. Like I went to school with it. I slugged through. It was painful, but I got tested at some point to understand what, what aspects of dyslexia I had. It's always like overcoming uh, adversity. I never, never stopped trying. I just always kept pushing, even if it was super painful. Um, I was like, well, what else am I going to do? You know? Have you ever had moments in your art career where you wanted to quit art? Oh, constantly. I mean, I, when I came from Baltimore, yeah. I didn't make work for two years. And then I was driving along. I saw a pile of chairs. They were from a restaurant. So I took all the ones and shoved it into my truck. And I just took the chair and I just created this arc. And I just was fucking elated and called it finally. And then I started making work again. And then these last couple of years, I mean, the pandemic was, you know, one thing, but I was already depressed, you know, like I just stopped making work and just kind of reset. But it's always in my head. I'm always making things in my head, but how things get out are not necessarily known to you. And so you kind of have to just always be open to that. It's never a clear path because, you know, you can always get what you want, but never the way you want it. Yeah, it's so true because in my mind, the work I make now is so subpar to what I have in my head. It's just that my skills and my resources and everything does not allow me to do the work that I know I can do or should do. But I think that's like do with what you have versus what you want. And then you might get what you want with what you have. Because you can get stuck in this loop. I'm very aware of that. So it's like once I, I think at 25, or somewhere in there, I, I was like, oh, you have to do this and you have to meet these markers and this and this and that. And it's like, God, you're driving yourself nuts. You're going to die doing this. So what's the fucking rush? It took the pressure off immensely. Just do it at your pace. Give yourself a break and, and be kind to yourself. And then you might actually make breakthroughs and just keep yourself open to those things, you know, because a lot of times we're our own worst enemy. That's true. So have fun yeah. with it. Yeah. What's your biggest challenge right now? 
I think it's just mobilizing and taking advantage of things. Biggest challenge is not getting lazy. I think when when you're not doing well, you start beating yourself up, you can go down. And I think it's just staying positive about what is possible. Biggest challenge is to keep one foot in front of the other, you know? And and if you're going to stand still, just don't go backwards, you know? Don't let don't your left self be torn from, you know, just, just take a moment, you know, sit on a bench and let the world go by for a moment and then get back up and keep walking you know time moves forwards so when you're in a low moment mm -hmm. is there a go-to trick or source of inspiration that helps you recharge creatively hmm it's a good one i mean going to museums i mean i don't do it as much as i used to i used to see a lot a lot of art but then sometimes it's actually doing the things on your list that you've been saying you want to do Go see a movie, go to a concert, um, go to a symphony. I mean, I went to, I think it's uh, Duda Mel, the Venezuelan director who got a lot of fanfare because he's one of the youngest directors of a Philharmonic, and he's amazing. I mean, just seeing him direct a symphony was mind-blowing. It's like being at a rock concert. The energy was quite moving, and, you know, stuff like that. Um, yeah, reading, I think just getting getting out or... Stepping outside of self is helpful and finding whatever that might be and being uncomfortable that you're comfortable with because I think those things have immense power and make connectivity that you might not normally come to. Yeah, I agree that it's important to be comfortable with discomfort. Yeah, no, I mean, you have to be because no one would do this in their right mind. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love it. I wouldn't trade it for the world. And I've always seen it. But it is can be lonely, especially because you're like, God, I wish someone would like it. <laughs> I don't believe in that. I think there's an exactly. audience for every art. Yeah. No, I mean, I think but that's what I'm trying to get at. At some point, you'll find your clan, you'll find your people, or find the people that look at it and get it right off the bat. You don't even have to say anything. And you're like, ah. Oh. If you had unlimited budget, because you mentioned budget constraints a lot, if you could just do anything in terms of size, location, anything mm -hmm. at all, what's your dream project? Dream project. Well, I mean, something like James Terrell's got it right with Roden Crater. I know that much. I would love to go to different parts of the world and create massive installations in the middle of fucking nowhere, like the Sahara Desert, the Salt Lakes up in Chile, or more closer is the Salt Lakes in the States, that when they get two inches of rain, become giant mirrors and create works within that framework. Would you mind if there's no one who sees it, you just make it in the no, middle of this, nowhere? No, I would be fine with it. If, if someone wanted to give me a budget of a size, so that basically 20 people on earth would see it, I'd be totally down doing it. <laughs> but then photographs or video might not do it justice, but it will definitely resonate. And I think that's like, can, can you make something that actually resonates? But the scale, I think, is important in, in sculpture. Not big is always better. That's not the case, but big does make a difference sometimes. That's like most of my work. I make things out of found objects, but they're huge. You know, kind of the anti Desuvru. Sarah, heavy metal artists. I thought it was kind of funny that I could make something the same size as their work, but for less. And it still had the same impact. Like I made these massive paper sculptures that read very, but are paper, you know, and people don't realize they're paper until they get really close to it. And so definitely to create things that don't seem as they are and are what they seem, you know, maybe make something that you could see from space or something that could float around the world so everyone can see it. <laughs> are you working on anything right now do you have something coming up nothing concrete um so just a lot of sticks in the fire i'm currently revamping my website finally getting everything together so hopefully that'll be the new place for all things me but instagram is pretty much the most extensive record i'm working on some smaller stuff like some 3d printed stuff that's on there basically miniatures in a way but that's still operating within the same principles of the work i do so that's in the works and then i also finished like a book of my works a little bit ago that's kind of a catalog of my work and success specifically mostly the serpentine and linear works 
that were out of fluorescent tubes. So where can people find that book? If they DM me on Instagram, um, that's the best. I'm What's your Instagram? Oh, my, sorry, that's a good thing to say. Um, Jason Peters Art. <laughs> that's the most reliable place that I can be reached. Um, I'll put the links to your Insta and your website in the show notes so people can go yeah. and check out your work and see it. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you so much. That was Jason Peters, based in Brooklyn, New York. You can check out his work on his Instagram at Jason Peters Art and on his website, jasonpeters.com. All links are in the show notes. Thank you for listening to the Installation Art Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit follow or subscribe on your podcast app. It really helps. Hey, just one more thing. If you're an artist working with installation or thinking about it or dreaming about it, I have something for you. I've created a private Facebook group called the Installation Art Society, where we can connect and exchange resources. Look for the link at the bottom of the show notes.